In the third soft chalk lesson of Unit 1, Lecture 3, we're going to be looking now at the gram-negative cell wall. Now, if you've already watched the soft chalk lesson on the gram-positive cell wall, a lot of the objectives in the second half will be the same as found there, and that relate to how the bacteria can initiate body defenses and how they can cause harm. That applies to all three cell walls, whether they're gram-positive, gram-negative, or acid-fast. So there's a little repetition here, uh, depending on the order you take these up. But this one deals with the gram-negative cell wall, so looking at some fundamental statements or bullet points. Because of the nature of the cell wall, gram-negative bacteria stain pink after gram-staining. The gram-negative cell wall consists of only two or three interconnected layers of peptidoglycan, but that is surrounded by an outer membrane. Peptidoglycan functions to prevent osmotic lysis in the hypotonic environment in which most bacteria live. The outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall is a semi-permeable structure. It has pore-forming proteins called porins, that allow nutrients to pass through the outer membrane. Surface proteins embedded in the cell wall can function as adhesins, secretion systems, and enzymes, much like they can in a gram-positive cell wall. Like the gram-positive cell wall, the gram-negative cell wall activates both the body's innate immune defenses and adaptive immune defenses. The body activates innate immunity by recognizing molecules unique to microbes that are not found on human cells. And again, these are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. Those pathogen-associated molecular patterns can then bind to pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs, on our defense cells to trigger the production of inflammatory cytokines. And inflammation is how our body can deliver defense cells and defense chemicals to an infection site. But an excessive inflammation can be harmful and even deadly to the body. PAMPs associated with the gram-negative cell wall will include peptidoglycan monomers, especially lipopolysaccharide or LPS found in the outer membrane, porins found in the outer membrane, and mannose-rich sugar chains. An antigen is a molecular shape that reacts with antigen receptors on lymphocytes to initiate adaptive immune responses. The actual portion or fragment of an antigen that reacts with antibodies and with receptors on B and T lymphocytes are called epitopes. Innate immunity is an antigen nonspecific defense that the body uses immediately or within several hours after exposure to a microbe. This is the immunity we're born with, and it's the body's initial response to eliminate microbes and prevent infection. Adaptive immunity is antigen-specific defense. It takes several days to become protective. It's designed to remove a specific antigen. And this is the immunity we develop throughout our life based on what we're exposed to. Humoral immunity refers to the production of antibody molecules in, the respon in response to an antigen. Cell-mediated immunity involves the production of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, activated macrophages, NK cells, and cytokines in response to an antigen. And this is what we use to get rid of infected cells and cancer cells that are displaying foreign epitopes. And cell wall molecules can also trigger the production of antibody molecules against cell wall antigens, including opsonizing antibodies that uh, can bind bacteria to phagocytes for more efficient phagocytosis, and antibodies against cell wall adhesins that can block attachment of bacteria to host cells receptors. So if you've done the gram-positive cell wall, you'll notice it from about um, seven on down. Those, that, those are same bullet points we had there. And again, the point is it doesn't matter if it's a gram-positive or a gram-negative or an acid-fast cell wall. They all trigger innate immunity. They all trigger adaptive immunity. And excessive immune responses can be harmful to the body. Our detailed learning objectives for the gram-negative cell wall 
uh, state what color gram negative bacteria stain after the gram stain procedure. Describe the composition of a gram negative cell wall and indicate the beneficial functions of peptidoglycan, the outer membrane, lipopolysaccharides, porins, and surface proteins. Define paraplasm. In terms of innate immunity, define pathogen associated molecular patterns or PAMPs, as well as pattern recognition receptors or PRRs. Describe how LPS and other PAMPs of the gram negative cell wall can promote inflammation. State the function of bacterial adhesions, secretion systems, and invasins. Compare and contrast innate immunity and adaptive immunity. In terms of adaptive immunity, define antigen and epitope. In terms of adaptive immunity, define humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. And finally, briefly describe how opsonizing antibodies can promote phagocytosis and how antibodies made against cell wall adhesins can block colonization. And again, like in the gram-positive cell wall, uh, from about six on down, those are the same objectives you saw to the gram-positive cell wall. So it's more of a repetition. So with a look at our bullet points and our detailed learning objectives and a reminder that we do have a highlighted bacterium here, E. coli, let's take a look at the content for the gram-negative cell wall. Now, as we learned earlier, uh, gram-negative bacteria are decolorized during the gram stain. They lose the purple crystal violet and pick up a pink counter stain called safranin. So gram-negatives appear pink under the gram stain, like this gram-negative E. coli shown in figure one. And again, the reason they stain the way they do is due to fundamental differences in the cell wall. And there's a lot of important gram negatives we'll be looking at during the semester, like Salmonella, Shigella, Neisseria species, Haemophilus influenzae, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Pseudomonas, and many others. And here's our second highlighted bacteria, E. coli. So again, you want to click on that. And I'll give you a description of the organism, its normal habitat, how it's transmitted, and the infections it causes. And given that description, you'll want to match that up with the name of the bacterium. I've also uh, included a uh, highlighted infection. That's a urinary tract infection. Uh, since there's some terms there we're gonna be talking about quite a bit, especially when we get to lab. So let's look at the structure and composition of the gram-negative cell wall. Now, whereas the gram-positive cell wall, we said, appears as a thick, dense layer of peptidoglycan because it's many interconnected layers of peptidoglycan, the gram-negative cell wall appears multi-layered. And that's because it consists of, first, a thin inner wall composed of peptidoglycan. But the peptidoglycan portion of the gram-negative cell wall is only about two or three nanometers thick because it's only two or three layers of peptidoglycan. Remember the gram-positive cell wall has multiple layers of peptidoglycan. So only about 10 to 20 percent of the gram-negative cell wall is peptidoglycan. Now what really makes the gram-negative cell wall unique compared to the gram-positive is that surrounding the peptidoglycan is a second membrane called the outer membrane. So there's a cytoplasmic membrane that lies internal to the peptidoglycan, and then an outer membrane that's external to the peptidoglycan. So the outer membrane is a lipid bilayer, like all membranes are. They're composed of phospholipids, but also lipoproteins, and something we see especially in the gram-negative outer membrane, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, as well as proteins. Now the phospholipids are found mainly in the inner layer of the outer membrane. Also in the inner layer of the outer membrane are lipoproteins and they function to connect the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan. The lipopolysaccharides or LPS are located in the outer layer of the outer membrane and they consist of a lipid portion called lipid A that's embedded in the membrane 
and then a polysaccharide portion that extends out from the outer membrane. And this LPS in the outer membrane is also commonly referred to as endotoxin, a toxin that's normally within the gram-negative cell wall because it's part of the lipopolysaccharide, which is part of the outer membrane. Now, in addition to the LPS, the uh, outer membrane has pore-forming proteins called porins, and they span the outer membrane and they provide channel for the entry and exit of solutes through the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall. So we don't see the active tra uh, transport and such in the outer membrane like we do in the cytoplasmic membrane. Anything that's gonna enter or leave the outer membrane has to fit through the pores in the outer membrane. And then also in the outer membrane, there are surface proteins which all bacteria have. And again, these tend to differ with the strain and species of bacterium. And finally, the paraplasma is the gelatinous material between the outer membrane and the peptidoglycan and between the peptidoglycan and the cytoplasmic membrane. So let's take a look at that in terms of our illustration up here. Now we said that uh, the gram-negative cell wall appears multi-layered when seen under an electron microscope. And notice in figure 2a, all the layers we see there surrounding the cytoplasm. There's the cytoplasmic membrane, which encloses the cytoplasm. Then surrounding that is a very thin layer of peptidoglycan, that thin black line running down the middle. And then outside of that is another membrane, the outer membrane. And so it's this outer membrane, thin layer of peptidoglycan cytoplasmic membrane that give that multi-layered appearance. And if we look at our illustration in figure 2b, we'll see again that the cytoplasmic membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Of course, that encloses the cytoplasm. Now remember in a gram-negative cell wall, there's only one or two layers of peptidoglycan uh, rather than numerous layers. So far, a fewer peptidoglycan chains. And then there's the outer membrane that surrounds that. Now, most of the inner layer of the outer membrane is phospholipid, the building block of membranes. But there's also, as we see, lipoproteins here that connect the outer membrane to the peptidoglycan. There are pores running through the outer membrane, composed of pore-forming proteins called porins. And that acts as a, a kind of a coarse molecular sieve to determine what goes through the outer membrane or what leaves the outer membrane. Mostly in the outer layer of the outer membrane is lipopolysaccharide or LPS, composed of lipid A and a polysaccharide chain. And then all bacteria have surface proteins on their surface that have various functions. So that's the structure and composition of the gram-negative cell wall as compared to the gram-positive. Now let's see what these components do for the bacterium. Well, of course, the peptidoglycan does what peptidoglycan does. It prevents osmotic lysis, prevents the bacteria from bursting in their hypotonic environment where they normally live. Now the outer membrane of the gram-negative cell wall can confer several functions. Like the cytoplasmic membrane, it is to a degree semi-permeable and it acts as kind of a coarse molecular sieve. So for molecules to cross the outer membrane, they have to fit through pores composed of pore-forming proteins called porins. And because of that semi-permeable nature, the outer membrane does help retain certain enzymes and it helps prevent some toxic substances, for example, penicillin G and lysozyme from entering most gram negatives. When the very first penicillin, penicillin G, came out in the 1940s, it was generally effective against gram positive bacteria, but seldom effective against gram negatives. And it wasn't until more was learned about the cell wall and we had electron microscopes that it was determined that the reason penicillin G didn't work on most gram negatives is that the pores in the outer membrane were too small. The penicillin G was too big to fit through the pore, so it never got to the peptidoglycan to interfere with peptidoglycan synthesis. Likewise, lysozyme uh, 
is an enzyme found in all of our body secretions that breaks down peptidoglycan. But again, it has trouble getting through the pores in the outer membrane, so it's more effective against gram-positive bacteria. Now, of course, since then, they developed penicillins that are smaller in size that will fit through the pore and are broad-spectrum penicillins that work on gram-positives and gram-negatives. And we'll also see later on that one of the ways bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics they were formerly sensitive to is that they can have a mutation in their porins where the pores become too small to let the drug in. Uh, also, the LPS in the outer membrane is thought to add strength to the outer membrane. And the outer membrane can also form vesicles. So uh, vesicles can form by pinching off the outer membrane, and they may contain things like quorum signaling proteins that we'll talk about later on, enzymes or toxins or virulence factors, and they can then fuse with other bacteria. So sometimes bacteria can transfer chemicals to other bacteria by producing vesicles from their outer membrane that fuse with the outer membrane of another grab negative. And then the surface proteins, like in gram-positive bacteria, if you've seen that soft chalk lesson, do the same thing. Uh, some of these are enzymes that carry out surface chemical reactions, but many of them are adhesins, molecules that allow bacteria to adhere intimately to our host cells in order to colonize those cells and resist flushing, like we see in figure three, where these represent adhesins proteins that are part of the surface of the bacterium that fit receptors on our cell and allow the bacteria to attach and resist being flushed away and thus colonize the cell. Also, uh, many bacteria can co-opt the function of host cells to the bacterium's benefit. And they do this through secretion systems. And that allows bacteria to directly inject bacterial effector molecules into the cytoplasm of our cell to alter either our cellular machinery or our cellular communication. And, and that winds up benefiting the bacteria to our detriment. And the most common type is a type 3 secretion system that eventually forms a hollow needle-like tube, like a syringe, called an injectosome. And that way bacteria can directly inject molecules. Uh, into our cell, including molecules called invasins that trick our cells into engulfing the bacteria and bring them inside the cell. And the function of the paraplasm, that has enzymes for nutrient breakdown, paraplasmic binding proteins for uh, the ABC transport system, etc. So again, this is similar to the animation in the gram-positive cell wall. This bacterium has adhesins that are part of its cell surface. These are surface proteins, and they wind up fitting adhesin receptors on a host cell. And if they fit that cell, then the bacterium can colonize that cell, resist being flushed away, and begin establishing itself. And then bacteria can also uh, produce secretion systems like injectosomes. So in this case, the bacteria would adhere with adhesins. And then the secretory system begins polymerizing a hollow protein tube that penetrates our cell and the bacterium can inject effector molecules into our cell. And these particular effector molecules shown in this animation are invasins. And they cause polymerization of actin within our cell causing pseudopods to form that engulf the bacteria, pinch off, bring the bacterium in and place it in a vacuole. And once inside the cell, defense molecules can't get at it if it's inside our cell and it gets free food because our cells bringing the food into our cell and the bacteria are in our cell. So we'll learn more about that in unit three when we look at benefits of the secretion systems. And there's a little self-check you can do there. Now, of course, just like the gram-positive cell wall, gram-negative cell wall components can initiate 
body defenses. So as we mentioned in a previous soft chalk lesson on the gram positive cell wall, the body has two immune systems, innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is antigen nonspecific. An antigen specific defense would be the other immune defense, adaptive immunity. And the innate immune response is what our body uses immediately or within several hours after exposure to a microbe to fight that microbe. It's the immunity we're born with and the body's initial response to try to eliminate the microbe and to prevent infection. Adaptive immunity is antigen specific and this takes several days to become protective and this is designed to remove a specific antigen we develop this immunity throughout our life. So since innate immunity is antigen nonspecific, this is activated by PAMPs binding to pattern recognition receptors. So in order to protect against infection, we have to recognize that microbes have invaded the body. And we do this by recognizing molecules that microbes have that human cells don't have. And during innate immunity, these are generalized molecules that many microbes share called pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. So these are molecular shapes, molecular patterns, associated with the bacterium or the other, or a virus or a protozoan or whatever. So these are the molecules on the pathogen that we're recognizing. And in the gram-negative cell wall, those PAMPs would include lipopolysaccharide or LPS, porins in the outer membrane, and fragments of peptidoglycan. And then we can also recognize mannose-rich glycans, uh, where many microbes have short carbohydrate chains called glycans, but they have the sugar mannose or fructose associated with them or as a terminal sugar, uh, whereas our glycans seldom have that. So again, LPS and porins would be PAMPs associated with all gram-negative bacteria because they all have LPS and porins. Peptidoglycan would be a PAMP associated with any bacteria that has a peptidoglycan cell wall. So the PAMPs bind to pattern recognition receptors or PRRs on our defense cells. And we're born with these pattern recognition receptors that have a shape that fit all the common microbial PAMPs. We can probably recognize over a thousand different PAMPs. And when the PAMP, the pathogen associated molecular pattern, the molecule on the microbe, binds to the pattern recognition receptor, the receptor that fits the PAMP on our defense cells, uh, that's going to trigger innate immune defenses like inflammation, fever, and phagocytosis. And inflammation is one of our first responses to infection or injury. So uh, the inflammatory response is how we deliver defense cells and defense chemicals where they're needed. Most of the body defense cells, like the white blood cells, are located in the blood. Defense chemicals dissolved in the plasma or liquid part of the blood, like antibody molecules and complement proteins also circulate in the blood. So inflammation is how our body defense cells and body defense chemicals are able to leave the blood where they're needed, at the injured or infected site. It wouldn't do any good to have these cells and these chemicals flow past the infected site. So what has to happen here is that the blood vessels have to become more permeable so that the plasma containing defense chemicals leaks out into the tissue, and so the defense cells can squeeze out of the blood vessels and enter the tissue and fight the infection. Now, the binding of the PAMPs on the microorganism to the pattern recognition receptors on the defense cells often then triggers uh, the body to produce inflammatory cytokines. And cytokines are regulatory chemicals that regulate every aspect of body defense. Virtually everything that goes on in the body that's related to body defense, like activating or deactivating defense cells, increasing or decreasing defense cells, 
all of that's regulated by cytokines. And some of these cytokines specifically promote inflammation, such as interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF, alpha, and such. And again, you don't have to know these names now, but we will take them up later on in Unit 3 and in Unit 5 when we talk about innate immunity and innate immunity and pathogenesis. So in the PAMP, the molecule on the microbe, as we see here, let's say LPS in a gram negative, like in figure five, binds directly or indirectly to a pattern recognition receptor on a defense cell that activates genes inside that defense cell to start transcribing and translating inflammatory cytokines. And these then cause inflammation. They lead to vasodilation where the blood vessels become more permeable so that defense cells and defense chemicals can leave the blood and enter the tissue at the infection site. The cytokines can also activate the blood clotting pathway and that eventually stops bleeding following an injury and it also causes clots to form around microbes to localize the infection and it also promotes more inflammation to deliver defense cells and chemicals. And these cytokines also activate the body's complement pathways, another part of innate immunity we'll learn about later on. And uh, these in turn can promote inflammation and promote phagocytosis and such. So the basic idea is that when the PAMPs on the microbe, from the microbe bind to pattern recognition receptors on the defense cells, that can trigger the production and secretion of inflammatory cytokines to trigger the inflammatory response to bring defense cells, defense chemicals to the area to activate the coagulation pathway and to activate the complement pathways to promote innate immunity. And just as PAMPs can initiate innate immunity, antigens are going to initiate adaptive immunity. So proteins and polysaccharides associated with the gram-negative cell wall do function as antigens to trigger adaptive immunity. And an antigen is defined as a molecular shape that will fit antibody molecules once they're made, but more importantly right now, they also fit receptors on lymphocytes. All of our B and T lymphocytes, which are white blood cells that regulate adaptive immunity, are, uh, have receptors on their surface unique to that cell that fits a specific molecular shape. And that's how we recognize an antigen as foreign. If it fits a receptor on a B lymphocyte and or a T lymphocyte, that's going to trigger an immune response against that specific shape. But we don't recognize the whole protein or the whole polysaccharide as foreign. It's too big. What fits the receptors on the B lymphocytes or the T lymphocytes or fits the antibody molecule once we make it is actually a small portion of that protein or polysaccharide called an epitope. So if that antigen was a protein, remember proteins are long chains of hundreds of amino acids and because certain amino acids interact with other amino acids, it has a three-dimensional shape but there's gonna be many areas along that protein where there might be a few amino acids sticking out and that order has a certain shape. So if the antigen is a protein, the epitope's typically about five to 15 amino acids with a unique shape that make up a portion of that protein antigen. So that would be one epitope there. A certain sequence of amino acids has that shape. This sequence has this shape. This sequence has this shape. And all of those are different epitopes that our lymphocytes can recognize as foreign, and we could make antibodies to fit each one of those different shapes. So there's a lot of different epitopes on a protein antigen, and it's not like we make one antibody that fits an organism, we make an antibody that fits every epitope of every protein of that organism. Now, if the antigen is a polysaccharide, polysaccharides typically only have one or two building blocks, one or two sugars, rather than the 20 amino acids that can be in any order on a protein, giving an infinite variety of different shapes. So if the antigen is a polysaccharide, the epitope would be three or four sugars branching off that polysaccharide, as we see here. 
So again, there could be a number of epitopes on a polysaccharide, but they're all the same epitope. They tend to have the same shape. So it's these molecular shapes, highly specific molecular shapes, that fit receptors on B and T lymphocytes that allow us to mount an adaptive immune response against that specific molecular shape. So again, we recognize antigens as foreign when epitopes of that antigen bind to receptors on B lymphocytes and or T lymphocytes. And again, we'll learn how all of this works in Unit 6. We're just looking at a few general definitions at this point. Now, there are two branches to the adaptive immune system, humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. Humoral immunity is the production of antibody molecules in response to an antigen, and that's carried out by B lymphocytes. As we'll see later on, lymphocytes are one of our five types of white blood cells. And they can in turn uh, neutralize organisms or neutralize toxins by binding to them. And so uh, we're going to look at some of the ways antibodies protect us as we go through unit one. And one of the primary ways that antibodies protect the body is if these antibodies are made against cell wall antigens, they can stick bacteria to phagocytes for enhanced phagocytosis. And that process is called opsonization or antibody stick microbes to phagocytes. So what happens during opsonization is that once our B lymphocytes recognize a specific shaped epitope of an antigen on a bacterium on the surface, then eventually we'll make antibodies where the tip of the antibody is tailor-made molecularly to fit that shape. Now, the tips of the antibody, antibodies tend to be Y-shaped molecules that are made during adaptive immunity composed of four protein chains. But the amino acid sequences at the two tips is very specific to fit a specific shaped epitope. So the FAB is the antigen binding fragment of the antibody, the portion of the antibody that has a shape that's tailor-made to fit one specific epitope. And the FAB part then binds to the epitope that's part of an antigen. But in opsonization, the FC part of the antibody, or the bottom of the Y, can fit FC receptors on phagocytes. And thus the antibody acts kind of like a superglue to stick the microbe very specifically to the surface of the phagocyte. And that's one of the first steps in phagocytosis the microbe has to be stuck to the surface before it can be engulfed and placed in a phagosome and eventually destroyed with lysosomes. So one of the ways the antibodies protect us is that they stick microbes to phagocytes for more enhanced phagocytosis. And that process is called opsonization. Now, another way they can protect us against bacteria is that antibodies can be made to fit epitopes of cell wall adhesins. And those are what allow the bacteria, of course, to adhere to cells. So this can prevent bacteria from adhering and colonizing our cells. So as we mentioned under adhesins previously, these are surface proteins that fit receptors on host cells that allow bacteria to lock on and resist flushing and begin colonizing the surface of that cell. But if we can make antibodies against the cell wall adhesins first, the FAB part or antigen binding fragment of the antibody is made to fit these epitopes of this adhesin, then the bacterium becomes coated with the antibodies, the adhesins can no longer bind to their receptors on host cells and the bacteria can adhere and it can be flushed away. And again, if those were opsonizing antibodies, they would then eventually stick it to phagocytes. So that's humoral immunity, the production of antibody molecules in response to an antigen. And that's a molecular response. These antibody molecules are, mo uh, antibodies are molecules we make that are tailor-made to fit microbes. Whereas cell-mediated immunity, the other adaptive immunity, involves the production of cytotoxic T lymphocytes primarily. And the cytotoxic T lymphocytes are the primary cells we use to get rid of infected cells and tumor cells and kill those 
infected cells or tumor cells through a cell suicide pathway called apoptosis that we'll learn about later on. So this is a cellular response more than an, a molecular response like humoral immunity. So we're using the cytotoxic T lymphocytes to recognize epitopes on infected cells and tumor cells. And we also activate other cells that are involved in body defenses like macrophages and NK cells and make lots of cytokines that we need to regulate immunity. So as we see, bacterial components in the cell wall can initiate both innate immunity, PAMPs binding to PRRs, triggering the production of inflammatory cytokines, and recognizing epitopes of antigens to trigger adaptive immunity. Now there's also significance in cell wall components in pathogenicity. Pathogenicity refers to the ability to cause disease. And this is the same mechanism that we use to defend ourselves with innate immunity against microbes. But if there's too much of that defense, it becomes harmful. So in part C, the previous part, we saw that when uh, PAMPs like LPS are released from gram-negative bacteria, they can eventually bind to pattern recognition receptor on defense cells, causing them to synthesize and secrete inflammatory cytokines. And when that's done in moderate amounts, when you have a moderate infection with fairly low numbers of microorganisms and low PAMPs, that inflammatory response sends out defense cells, defense chemicals, and they help eliminate the infection. But if you have a severe systemic infection where bacteria are infecting body systems such as the blood and going to all parts of the body, we have large numbers of bacteria present, high levels of LPS are released, the primary PAMP in a gram negative. And in fact, that LPS uh, is so potent that when it was first discovered, they named it endotoxin. So that's synonymous with the LPS or lipopolysaccharide in the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacterium. And it was called endotoxin because it was a toxin that's within the cell wall and released when the bacterium is degraded or when it uh, is, uh, releases molecules during replication. So in a systemic infection where you have high levels of bacteria, high levels of PAMPs like LPS are released and we get excessive cytokine production. But now you have too much inflammation, too much activation of the coagulation pathway, too much activation of the complement pathway, and the results become harmful rather than beneficial. And we'll look at all these harmful effects in detail in unit three. In fact, we're going to spend a whole lecture talking about systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, which uh, is a leading cause of septic shock during bacterial infections. So when there's too much inflammation, then the white blood cells can start discharging their killing chemicals inside the blood vessels, which damages the blood vessel, causing leakage of blood. <coughs> Clots can start forming within the blood vessels and plug up blood vessels called disseminated intravascular coagulation. When you have this excessive inflammatory response in the lungs, the vasodilation that causes increased capillary permeability, <coughs> which normally allows defense cells and defense chemicals to get out, causes the alveoli to become filled with plasma and or blood, and that causes ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And all of that, the hypovolemia or drop in blood volume, the drop in blood pressure, the lack of oxygenation of the blood can lead to hypoperfusion, where the blood can no longer deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the body, and those cells and tissues and organs can then die. So uh, the same mechanism we use to recognize bacterial infections and viral infections and protozoan infections and such, uh, the PAMPs binding to PRRs is the same mechanism when you have an excessive infection that can lead to harm from an excessive inflammatory response. Now, again, the details like the ARDS and DIC and the mechanisms you don't have to worry about at this point. We're going to take that up in detail in Unit 3 under pathogenesis. <clears throat> 
and also in unit five when we get to innate immunity in more detail. But the point right now is that typically PAMPs, such as those found in the gram-negative cell wall like LPS and peptidoglycan and porins, can bind a pattern recognition receptor on defense cells, causing them to release inflammatory cytokines. And in moderate amounts, that leads to localized inflammation, which sends defense cells and defense chemicals to the injured and infected site, removing the microbes. But if you have too many microbes in the body and too many PAMPs are released, that leads to excessive cytokine production and that excessive inflammatory response can then become very damaging and even fatal to the body. And that is the gram negative cell wall. There's our summary at the end uh, where you can uh, do a little self quiz.